Okay, let's pick up where we left off with JDBC. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, kind of show you another application. And, and I don't believe we really need to see this compiled and run. I think it's better to sort of look at the source code again. And then uh, I actually have three more examples of JDBC that go along with assignment number one, I believe. Uh, I believe yeah, it's either one, one or two. Is the oldest SQL yeah, so assignment one for this course has got uh, a bunch project of data. One, project, one. project one, I'm sorry. Yeah, pro yeah you're right. Project one is going to have three JDBC um, examples. If I have time at the end, I'll go through those. Otherwise, you can easily go through those on your own. Uh, also has SQL queries and data to be populated yes, in. in yeah. And uh, you can use this lecture, which is called JDBC.PPT, and you can use those examples and everything you've seen so far should be a significant help in terms of putting together that project. So let's take a look at a real-life example. So example number one is setting up tables via JDBC, running DDL commands instead of DML commands, which is the difference what we haven't really seen so far. And uh, this is really the concept of designing an application from an application. If you think about it. So the coffee tables themselves to get started. We're first going to examine the code for creating the new tables. Uh, so this code, in fact this is the interesting thing, you can install Oracle or MySQL or it can be out on your website, you know, on your GoDaddy or something like that and uh, you can write a Java program like this one here that creates the database, creates everything and sets the user privileges and does everything. Every DL command uh, you can run through the JDBC connection, same way as a DML. So the Java code here is going to create a table for storing the coffee data. And this is, you know, I'm not going to go through the SQL because this is not a database course, but the create table coffees. And so you can create this table using MySQL, but you can also create it via JDBC. Uh, so it is quite common to see, uh, what do you call them, um, utility programs written in Java just for the developers or just for the people. And this is actually kind of interesting because it's easier to archive. It's easier to actually write a little utility program for the support people or for the database people to or you know developers to use, just in case the database goes down and they want to recreate it or the site moves to a different location. You don't have to worry about whatever tool sets or anything that the new site or the other people have. You don't have to ask them for any help at all. You just run the program again, essentially, and you run the program and it creates all the information. So uh, what we're going to do here is we have a few things to note about the uh, table itself. The columns are named uh, supplier ID, contains an integer value indicating supplier ID, and it's going to be stored. Uh, in this case, the supplier ID is going to be referenced as a foreign key, and this is where your knowledge of SQL really comes in handy. Because if you've learned SQL, you know how to identify a column as a foreign key, and you know how to do it as a primary key, and you know how to put constraints and not null and stuff like that in there. In fact, if you look at this code here, you kind of you don't really see that level of detail in the script. All you really see is just the data type that's associated with it. But you can do that in the SQL query. So the columns are named sales. That's going to store the values for the SQL integer, uh, type integer. Um, total is going to be an integer, um, as depicted in the last example. And uh, this example is going to run through here a simple program and look how small it is actually well it's going to continue on the next page uh, but create coffees and if this were an object let's say this were a class and you had another program built and a driver program that said restore the database it could drop truncate everything and then create coffees and what you're ending up doing is automating the process of recreating the system uh, so here's our string. Uh, it's going to be MySQL localhost web database, and it's going to run. And I'm going to kind of go through this a little bit quicker because we don't really have to. I've already done this in a lot more detail. But here's what I, the part that I'm going to go in. And here's my six six steps again. So number one, the driver. Number two, uh, getting the connection. So we get connection with this URL. Very common to see the URL put into a string, and the string that we have it put into is this one right here. Yeah, so very common to see that. The statement creates a statement. It's going to be a create statement. It's going to be execute an update on the create statement. And close the statement, close the connection. And voila, we're done. So that was it. Example number one. <laughs> and example number two inserting data via the JDBC connection. And I'm going to skip the text for it and just show you the source code. 
step number one. Obviously, it's going to get boring after the next example. It's the same code. Same, same code over again. Step number two, a little different. No, not really. Same code. Get same the connection. Code. Step number three is different. Step number three, however, and step number four, execute, excuse me, excuse me, step number three here with the execute the update, execute the update, a little redundant, actually. Probably could have done this a little bit better. Uh, however, we're not doing a prepared statement. We're just doing an update. Common to see this as well. It's also common to see a whole string that is put in that's going to essentially run a, a really big query. Uh, Close the statement, close the connection. Step number three, querying the data versus uh, via the JDBC driver. Uh, so the query, we've already seen the query actually. Step number one, load the driver. Step number two, get the connection. Step number three, create the statement. Step number four, this is different. We're going to query. Now we're going to see, we're going to look at this a little bit and go, well, while this is the result set that we've gotten back from select star from coffees. And this is going back to what you commented on earlier. What happens if you have a select star? Well, then you got to take a look and see what's in there. Um, string name, coffee name, get the integer, supplier number, the price. So we're now we're starting to see the get string, get integer, get float, get integer, get string. Just a, basically a way of parsing from this is the label of the column that's in there. And then we're going to print it out to the screen where we're printing out the values that are inside of Oracle. Excuse me, Java. So once we bring the values from the Oracle or the SQL system from the query, from the result set, we parse it, we put it into the variables, and we start using the variables. And then it becomes regular or standard old Java, everything that we've been familiar with so far. Close the statement, close, close the result set, close the statement, close the connection. So here we actually close the result set. If we hadn't closed the result set, it would have been closed by garbage collection automatically. Yeah. But really, the only two that we have to close would be the statements and the connection, if we wanted to. Exception handling. OK, so those were the extent of the examples I was going to show you. But I want to give you a few little notes on the exception handling, because I haven't really talked about that outside of ones that you can throw. And that's important to know which ones you can throw. The biggest one is the SQL exception. And nearly every JDBC method can throw this one. Almost every method can throw the SQL exception. In fact, in the example that I saw, the connection through the SQL, when I didn't have Oracle, I actually had an SQL exception that was thrown. It had nothing to do with SQL. It, had nothing to do, it was just the connection that wouldn't make it. In response to the data access error, well, because it couldn't get to the connection, it couldn't access it. If more than one error is actually thrown, they're actually chained together. This is common with other Java exception handling. In terms of the exception, it contains, here's the pieces, a description of the error in terms of the get method, get message, excuse me, method. The SQL state, which is going to be open group SQL specification, uh, identifying the exception, get SQL state. The state could be something referred to as uh, the error level. The vendor specific integer error code. This is where the drivers actually differ a little bit. Some drivers will actually have vendor specific uh, information that will be set. Most of them right now do. Some of the earlier drivers don't. I will tell you that the Oracle driver has all of the Oracle specific error codes. Connector J has nothing. <laughs> uh, good luck on the older ones. I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say that. I haven't tried a Connector J driver in over a year. So it's possible that they have updated it, but it's an open source, free kind of thing. Not too much support, but it works, you know. Uh, so the codes may not necessarily be updated, and the errors may not make, make, make any sense at all. A chain to the next SQL exception, get next exception. So if you get more than one, it might be easier to kind of follow through the chain to see, well, which one caused which one? Which one caused that one? Here's an example of actually looking at it. If we did a try, we had some JDBC code in here. We did a connection, excuse me, we did a catch on the SQL exception. Down here on the bottom, we're going to say get next exception, which means we're only going to get the first, we're going to only get the last one, excuse me, that comes out of here. If we do the get next, we're going to get the next one, the next one, the next one. We're going to get the, every one of them that's going to actually come out of there instead of uh, 
I believe, well, you know what, I believe it's the first one, I'm sorry. It's the first exception that actually gets caught and then the next ones get stored. And the, store, the cached ones that get stored are the ones we're getting next to. But usually we would have um, some, you know, reason for doing this and it would be part of the troubleshooting or the debugging. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, maybe, maybe one database is actually uh, establishing the connection well but another database isn't for some reason. Let's take a look at the use of the prepared statement in a little bit more detail to show you a little bit more on the programming syntax of it. Using the prepared statement so far uh, will show us so the statement object for querying and updating tables. Uh, so we know that it's used for in terms of the statement. The prepared statement object provides similar functionality, faster execution. It is really, as we've seen already, the parametized. So it gives us parameters for the SQL statements. So unlike the statement object, the prepared statement object is given to the SQL statement when it is created. Here's the advantage. The statement will be sent to the database directly where it will be pre-compiled. So some people used to call these something similar to a stored procedure or pre-compiled statement. Uh, it follows through on the same line. However, it's the JDBC driver that's controlling this and not the Oracle database, which means it doesn't actually provide any system load or impact on the database, which is actually kind of nice. It's in the memory associated with the object and the connectivity and with the connection that's going on. It's nothing to do with the database, which is nice. It doesn't get stored in the database at all. As a result, the prepared statements are generally faster to execute that, uh, than regular statements because you only send it once. And not only that, but it gets cached. It's there in memory, already loaded, already compiled. There's no recompile. Every time you send a statement via the connector driver to the database, it gets compiled. <laughs> so even though you're just sending one over another, it's the compiling, it's the, it's the connectivity between the driver and the database that is where the bottleneck is going to appear, essentially. If there is one, prepared statement, you send it once, you run it multiple times. You can run the same statement over and over again and there's no recompile either. So it could be parameterized, so the uh, prepared statements are generally more convenient than uh, that of regular statements because they can easily be containing parameters. As an example, you can create a SQL template and then specify the parameters for the SQL query. Here's our example on our coffee beans. So as a statement object, you can uh, create a prepared statement object with the connection method. Here is an example. This is very similar to the examples that we've seen already where we have the question marks that are inserted and the question marks are numbered. The first one would be one, the second one would be two, etc. So in this example, the question mark is indicating the parameter of the placeholder, which is set by the API. So setting the parameters, once you have the parameter st statement already, you need to supply it. And we've sort of seen this already, uh, but this is a little bit more detail on what we're doing in terms of the set. The values for each one of the question mark placeholders. So you do this by calling one of the set methods defined in the prepared statement, which is set a string, set an integer. So it's almost like get a string, get an integer, get a float, set an integer, set a string, set a float. It's a method that's actually called on it and it substitutes the question mark value with an integer value with a float value. We actually have to specify the data type. If you use this, the set actually, the set method is expecting you to say, here's the information, and here's the type that it is, and here you go. And this is for number one, this is for number two, that's number three, as we've seen already. Um, so the method is a type of Java programming language, actually, in general, um, and it's a method that's being run uh, on the Java string. So here's an example. And this XXX is substituted by the data type. First argument indicates which question mark uh, the placeholder is to set. And the second argument indicates the replacement value. In this example, update sales set integer the first question mark to 75 as an integer, or to set a string to Colombian. Most people either end up forgetting to put the quotation marks on here or forgetting to use a string here when they want a string. It's just, you know, you get too much in the habit of going, yeah, set this, set that, or they just go set and they leave out the data type. Yeah, which is common as well. And then you go, why isn't that working? I set it. But you had to specify the data type that you're setting. So the two code fragments accomplish the same thing. So let's take a look here. 
we have an easier way of doing it, and we have a longer way of doing it. And this is what I said before, we can string them together. So here we have code fragment number one. We have update sales is equal to 75 plus. So this is the long one. Oh, this is, I'm sorry. This is an example showing you with and without the parameters. So this one doesn't have use of parameters. It's basically just using the values themselves. And this one is using the statement, and then it's using the values after it. And most people would look at this and go, well, isn't this one easier? <laughs> Fewer lines of code, more streamlined. This one takes longer than this one. If I took this one and copied it and put it in there and ran it, it's going to take longer. Because we haven't, and especially, it might be actually, mm, no, it's probably going to be about the same for the first entry. It's the second and the third and the fourth entry that are going to be much faster. If we, because this statement's already there, and the next time we run these guys, these guys are going to run faster. Yeah. Which is why we're doing this. Uh, we're executing a prepared statement here. To execute the prepared statement, we either execute an update or an execute a query, same as the regular prepared regular statement, except that no SQL parameter is specified, because it's already been specified. So, prepared statement, we don't have to actually do it. We have a clear parameters which we haven't seen yet. So once the parameters have been set with a value, it will retain the value until the reset to another value. What if the customer doesn't enter anything in? Are you going to run it twice? If you clear the params, run the method to clear the parameters on that statement, then it's going to come up with an error. And you're going to be able to check to see the customer didn't put anything in. There are so many programs out there that don't do this. It's amazing because you notice that when it runs, you don't put anything in there, but it still runs. It's like this: the, the, the blanks are empty, and you hit OK, and it just took whatever you had last time. And it comes back and says, oh, I'm sorry, already in there. I'm sorry, already in there. It comes back with some duplicate kind of message. Why not just clear it out, and then you can come out with, why don't you enter the information you'd like to search on? So it's a, user, it's a usability thing. It depends on whether or not you're doing an update. It depends on what you're doing in terms of you know, how do you want to air check it, essentially. But you do have the method of uh, clearing out the parameters. And you can also create one, uh, you can therefore create one prepared statement and set two parameters, then execute, or set just one parameter. It can work towards your advantage, as an example. Let's say you want to find all books by a particular author and the author's name is going to stay the same. Why make the user keep entering in the author's name? Just leave it in there. And then they can be entering in the book titles or the ISBNs or something or you know something associated with it. And then re-execute it over and over again. And it caches the first parameter or the second one or anyone, anyone that's not cleared, anyone that's not given. So here's an example where we've got a set one and 100. We're going to set a string a two to a French roast. We're going to set... Uh, we're going we're gonna to do an update here. We're going to change the sales column of French roast to 100. Um, we are going to update this to espresso. And now the change to sales to row to 100. The first parameter stayed at 100. The second one was reset to espresso. So and here we have the one is going to stay because we didn't do anything, but we're going to change it to, we're just going to change the second one. So when you're playing around with multiple parameters and you want the existing ones to stay the same, then you don't do any clear. If you want everything to be re-entered in again, if you run the clear parameters, it's going to come back and say, hey, you didn't specify a parameter. Or it's going to use null, or it's going to use whatever the database upon no information is going to automatically do. Hopefully your database is going to give you an error. If you've got the data, and this is the other thing too. So somebody created this database. <laughs> Did they actually, you know, put in constraints on the columns and on the rows? Do they have foreign keys and primary keys? And do they have not nulls? And, you know, is there integrity in the database? Nine times out of ten, no. The answer to that question is no, because they made it as easy as possible for people to work with it. And here's how databases get messed up all the time. Well, it doesn't matter. So let's say, for example, we did this, but... We didn't think about the concept that the user didn't leave, you know, didn't put one in or didn't put a right value in. It was really a string and it was they entered in a float or something. And the database just takes it because everything's a string. It doesn't check for data types, doesn't check for keys or anything. And then you have your application constantly populating the data with bad information. The application looks like it works just fine. Yep, we updated your user account. Database says, yep, we updated the user account. No problem. No errors were 
but you have really bad data that someone eventually is going to have to go back in and clean up. <laughs> so, so they always tell you in database classes, enforce referential integrity, separate the data out, make sure the columns are the right column type, the right size, you've got the right, you know, null, not null, the integers or strings, and make sure, you know, you've actually implemented the rules correctly. That's actually because it's harder to build applications to violate it. So if you've got an application, it works for and against you. Number one, it makes it harder for you to violate the rules. But number two, it allows you to error check it. If the database error comes back and you can catch it through the driver and you can say, null, can't be null or something, or you get this code that comes back out of the driver from the database error, if the driver actually implements the status messages, then you can go, oh, okay, then you can go back to the user and say, hey, enter in a value for this. But normally, on a web program, it's done with form checking. So people, you know, they bypass the entire problem of having to troubleshoot the driver control by making a form checker, you know. If you left something blank, you know, or if you, something is a string and it should be a number, you know, check it before they enter, the data actually gets into the database. So it's a design philosophy. Where do you want to check it? What do you want to use? So you can use a loop to set values as well. So you can often make uh, coding easier by using a loop for a while loop to set values of the input parameters and it makes a lot of sense especially if you've got a prepared statement and you're just going to send it some information. So the code fragment is going to illustrate a basic idea in the next slide. One prepared statement is created and a loop is going to run five times. Each time through it's going to set the values and execute the query statement. And it updates the sales for five different coffees. And here we go. This is not bad. This is pretty easy in terms of the code itself. The execute query always runs, always returns uh, the result set object. So I'm returning values from the execute update. And I thought I had an example in here for the loop, and I don't, but you can imagine what that would look like probably at this point. So, uh, so the return value is looking at the return values for the execute update. Um, execute query is also going to return the result set of the object. Um, and you could copy the result set into a result set object, as it's an object to an object. The update returns an integer, indicates how many rows have been updated. And as an example here, testing it, we've seen this already. And it's going to be equal to execute update. This is the part that takes kind of a little bit of time, but if you're a C programmer, you're, you're used to doing this, because this is how you check return values and stuff. Uh, but if n is equal to 1, because no row had been changed, changed in it. So in this case only one row was affected, hence up returns one. Uh, when the method to execute update is used, execute a table creation or alteration statement, it always returns zero. Zero means correct. Yeah. Versus an error. If it doesn't return zero, it's not going to return anything. If it doesn't return anything. Yeah. yeah. Well, on an update, it's used to execute a table creation alteration statement. It always returns zero. Because what else are you going to return? <laughs> uh, yeah, we changed it. Uh, good, thank you. <laughs> uh, here's an example. Oh, here's my for loop. I thought my for loop was earlier. but uh, Anyway, here's that for loop I was talking about. And uh, here's the, here it is actually down here for i is equal to length, i plus plus, go through uh, in terms of uh, sticking the information in. This is pretty streamlined. We've updated, and this will run very efficiently. So we've prepared a statement. Uh, for updating sales, and the update's going to have a sales and it's going to have a coffee name, same query as we were using before. And now we have a we have an array here actually, yeah. So we're going to use an array with this, and the array of coffees here's here. And now we're going to update these this array the sales per week for the array of coffees, and we're going to stick it in here. So we have the sales per week and we have the coffees for each one of them. This is a nice way of kind of doing reporting at the end of the day. How many of these items did you sell? How many of those items did you sell? I mean, you know, basically, um, how many items with the item number, the item description? And you're basically, if you're not working on a system that is real time connected to another database, you can update the database with the sales activities by running a program that would look through, let's say, um, the local database and gather this information, create a prepare statement, send it over to the other database, and then just put the information in there, which might be a very efficient way of doing it if you had to do it that way. Um, or if you had a client who was updating stuff. Uh, and maybe this was an address book or something. Maybe this was uh, updating an address book.
using joins. You can join tables through SQL as well. So sometimes you need to use two or more tables to get the data that you want. Uh, anything you can do in SQL, you can do through JDBC. So for example, a proprietor of coffee breaks, coffee break wants a list of coffees he buys from Acme Inc. Oh, these companies are kind of funny. Uh, this involves data from two different tables, coffees and suppliers. To do this, you must perform an SQL join. A join in a database operation that relates two or more tables by means of a value that are shared in common. This is going to be a join on a field. So in our example, we're going to have a tables, coffee, and suppliers, both with a column called supplier ID, which can be used to join them together. So the supplier table, before going any further, we need to create the suppliers table, which we haven't created yet. In fact, you can actually cut and paste this code and put it in and create these tables and run these queries. This is all executable code, although you will have to change the SQL, MySQL, to Oracle driver. Yeah, but you know how to do that. Yeah. Oh, this is really easy to do, actually. Uh, so the code, here's the code here, create the table suppliers, and this is the code to actually create the suppliers table and actually populate it. So this is the code below that's going to be inserted into the three suppliers. And this, by the way, is what you're doing for the first project. I'm giving you the data that you're putting in. I'm giving you, you don't have to do it through the JDBC driver. You could if you wanted to. You can just run it, open up that SQL window and go log into the HR account and cut and paste the stuff into the window and you're done, essentially. Um, you might have to, you know, make sure the data types and stuff match correctly. Um, you might actually, depending upon which database you're working with, I believe I did that example in MySQL and the dates. Here's the interesting thing, and you'll get this, you'll get familiar with this the more you start playing with databases. In most databases, the format of the date is different. Yeah, so the syntax, I'm going to show you an example. I'll probably wait till tomorrow morning. I'll show you an example on uh, inserting in data, and you'll see the date format's different for SQL, MySQL, than it is for Oracle in terms of the entry. Um, we don't have any dates in this example, but that first project has dates in there, and I believe you're going to need to change the syntax. Yeah. So if you get errors when you start putting the data in for that first assignment, uh, just look at the data. And if the update's failing, you know, look at the format for the for the dates. That's probably your problem. So, verifying uh, the new data, following the code selection, uh, the whole table. Uh, you can basically just run a query on here. Select star from suppliers. It's going to give you this information out here. So, in the last example, because um, I deviated a little bit, I'll just come back on track here. We created the table. We put the data into the table. Now we're querying it to kind of see what's in the table to verify the data. Now we're going to join it. So now we can join both tables. We can proceed with a join. So the goal is to find coffees that are purchased from a particular supplier. So since both tables have the supplier ID, we can use an ID to perform the join. This is kind of a review of your database class if you haven't seen this yet. Uh, so since you're using two tables from within the same SQL statement, you're usually indicating it with a table name dot a field name. So for example, coffees dot supplier IDs or suppliers dot supplier ID. I haven't seen that yet. Uh, so here's your join statement. And the query is going to be select coffees dot coffee name from co coffees comma suppliers. Or suppliers dot supplier name is like. This is going to be using a like Acme Inc. And suppliers dot supplier ID is equal to coffees dot supplier ID. So basic join. If this, if you're not comfortable with these SQL statements, I highly recommend, if you haven't done this already, you need to take a database class. I can't teach you databases along with JDBC. If you've taken my database class, you've seen this already. If you haven't taken my database class and you want to watch the videos, it's all on YouTube. <laughs> Go in there, look in the database class, and you'll see there's two lectures, about four and a half hours of, I, I think I call it SQL boot camp. And I go through everything possible in terms of SQL. So, and I know that's in there. So you can find that out, example there. If you're, if you're desperate enough, you can go through there and find it. And uh, here's the join results. The code fragment on the last slide will produce the following output. Coffee's bought from Acme Inc. We got Colombian and Colombian decaf. The full code is available on the next few slides here. And here are the next few slides. 
don't really need to go through this because it's going to be kind of boring by now because we already know this. Number one, load the driver. <laughs> number two, <laughs> number three, number four, number five, six. So you can see the six steps on here. You can actually download, uh, you can download this example. Um, actually, you can't download this example. I used to have it available and I took it off, but uh, you can cut paste the, the slide set. I'm sorry? Areas Areas? Alias. Aliases, yes, you can use everything. You can use aliases. You can use anything possibly imaginable. Everything. Every SQL syntax you can use in a regular query. And the interesting thing is, is that if you're using the driver and the JDBC connection for MySQL, and MySQL has a, some special, like we have Oracle Plus, SQL Plus, and so does MySQL. It has like, it's not called Plus, but it has special MySQL. Uh, DDL, it's usually DDL stuff like describe and stuff or tables and stuff. You can use the anything that's specific towards the database. So if you're connecting to an Oracle database, you got to use the Oracle SQL Plus. MySQL, you can use all of their specific MySQL stuff. It just doesn't, no, it doesn't the driver doesn't know any different. It just sends it to the database and the database handles it. So what I've just covered is everything and everything I ever wanted to know about JDBC. Um, in a lot of detail, I hope. Uh, right now, we're going to talk about the concept of using database transactions, a slightly different tangent, because we still have some time left. Uh, we'll finish this lecture off, and then maybe we'll go home after this today, because uh, it's about a 10 to 3 right now. So. Losing half the people here already anyway, so <sighs> we, can, we can finish up tomorrow. So the concept of using a transaction, there are two times, or there are many different times, there are times when you do not want one statement to take effect unless the other one also takes effect. Uh, so for example, take $400 out of a checking account, and this is supposed to be a bullet point, I'm not quite sure what these things are doing here. Take $400 and transfer it to a savings account. Well, you don't want to take it out of one account, and then, oh, lost the connection, <laughs> and then put it into the other account. So if the statement succeeds, uh, but the second one fails, you're out $400. No, that never happens, does it? I don't know. Uh, to do this possibly, most databases support many different levels of what's called transactions. So using transactions, a transaction is a set of one or more statements that are executed together as a unit. Hence, either all of the statements are going to succeed or none of them are going to succeed. So one of the things you may have noticed, and I pointed it out, actually, the auto commit button that was in, X, in the SQL window. Um, you play around in JDBC, you really want to turn off any auto commits, and you want to actually manually commit. If you do that, then you're, you're ensuring, after you've done your checks and if you put in your proper error checking, then you actually make sure that your transaction actually succeeded. Otherwise, you're going to end up with nightmare, nightmare problems, and it's not even going to be technical problems is going to be customers calling and complaining to you. <laughs> and where's my $400? Sorry, my JDBC connection failed. Uh, so when a connection is created, it is an auto commit mode. You can tell the driver to not auto commit. You can turn this off and on by the driver, which is what I'm going to get into in the next couple of slides here. This means that each one of the individual SQL statements is treated as a transaction when auto commit is turned on and it will automatically be committed after each one is executed. So the way to allow two or more is to group them together in a transaction and disable the auto commit. So here we have connection, and this is done on the connection object because it's the connection that we're actually interested in establishing. Set auto commit to false. Not a bad idea. If you're running more than one transaction and each one of the transactions you need to check the error code, then you commit. You send a commit after that. So it demonstrates the following line of code, and the following line of code is going to basically turn auto commit to false, and then we run a commit. So committing a transaction, so once auto commit mode is disabled, no SQL statement will be committed until a you call the commit, or you can call a rollback. If you call a rollback, and that $400 gets put back into the first account that it was taken out of. So all the statements execute after the previous call to the method a commit will be included in the current transaction and then commit together as one unit. So the code on the next slide illustrates the basic concept. Here it is right here. <clears throat> so set auto commit to false. Write a bunch of stuff. Uh, anyway, write a bunch of whole bunch of stuff here. And then connection.commit. 
you don't have to send, and can you possibly imagine why, you don't have to send a commit command via SQL? Because what if your commit command fails? <laughs> so the theory and the object, the, the whole thing is the object of the connection is supposed to be controlling the connectivity. So you still, you tell the object to do that. And if you still have control of the object, then you know that your commit is actually working. If you just send a commit, which you can actually send, send a commit. So going back to what I said about Oracle and SQL, you can send a bunch of stuff. Rollback, commit, all this stuff via SQL. If you do it the way you do the statements, there's no guarantee that the connection object is actually performing. It may, your connection object may be in la-la land, and your transaction is partially committed, and you don't know. So it's better to work from it on the object level, from the JDBC driver. So you have full control over what's going on. So here we have, uh, then we're going to set auto commit back on to true. So you can turn it off, turn it on. It's per session. So whenever you're using it, by default, it is turned on to true. Uh, so you have to uh, disable it. So, And the rollback, you might imagine, works just like the commit, but it's the opposite. So to cancel a transaction, you call the rollback method. And this aborts the transaction, restores the values to what they were before the attempted the update. Rolls back everything just the same way as it does in your regular database class when you first learned it. Um, so if you're executing multiple statements, generates an SQL exception. In the exception handling, you should call the rollback. So the method to abort the transaction and start it over again. Complete example on the next slide. Here we have our transaction pairs. We are going to commit. We are no. We're going to send the stuff in here. Send the stuff in here. Send it. Here we go. Auto commit right down here. I believe we have uh, set auto commit to false. In the error exception handling, I skipped through a little bit here. Is going to have the rollback somewhere in here. But um, try. Hmm. It's okay. It's in there somewhere, but uh, auto commit. You want to turn off to false. If if you turn auto commit off, then you can roll back or commit. And if you get an exception, if it throws an exception, the concept is to roll back in the exception code. If it comes back and says, "Oh, there was a problem with that." And then you roll back and it erases everything that happened. And then you commit. And then you turn auto commit back on. So here we have the, the, the way you normally see is the auto commit goes off. We do a bunch of stuff. Then we commit and we turn auto commit back on to true. Because next time we run it, we may want it on. Want For a single stuff. statement, we might want it on. For multiple statements, we might not want it on. Yeah. And I believe this example was supposed to be running a, uh, a rollback, but I don't actually see it. It could be that I'm not looking close enough or slow enough on this, but uh, I don't think it's there, actually. It should have been in the... Uh, oh, here it is. You know what? I just didn't go to another slide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is on the slide here. Here's the rollback right here. And the rollback is occurring... This is the part I was looking for. I just didn't go didn't far enough through the example. It is in the try. So if the connection is null, uh-oh, then we're going to roll it back. And the rollback on the connection should work even though the statements don't work. So the driver should go back and tell the other end if the connection is still active. If the connection is not active, you might be in a bad situation. If you've lost the connection, you're halfway through the transaction and your internet goes down. <laughs> and your connection object still thinks it's connected. Well, when if the program is still running, when it's going to keep trying and trying and trying, then you're going to get an error message on the rollback. If you get an error message on the rollback, then your program logic has to go back through, establish a brand new connection, and then roll it back. And then uh, you also have the coordination. Well, what is the database going to do? <laughs> In the meantime, client went away. Database is still out there. This is one of those weird things that you run into, that it's the logic of the, what, what's happening with the program that is kind of tricky to troubleshoot. Uh, it can be sort of a, sort of can be a challenge, I want to say in terms of the construction of the program. And uh, so the, the problem with using, I was going to say problem, the skill in using JDBC is not necessarily in the programming part of it, it's in the logic. Knowing 
the order of the transactions and which statements are belonging to the transaction, remembering to turn the auto commit off, turning it back on. And then if you're going to run a, a rollback in this particular case and you've lost your internet connection, that's not going to do very much good. <laughs> so, you know, checking for that message as well. This wouldn't be at the SQL level, actually, this would be at the connection. You would hopefully you would hopefully be able to get a higher level, maybe a connectivity, which is going to come out of the SQL exception. And this is why you'd want to go through all of these error messages to see what happened. Because if you truly lost the connection, then you're going to need to run something else outside of this program to fix the problem that just occurred. So you may not be able to catch everything. But assuming that your connection is still active, the rollback should roll it back. So if you're curious uh, to learn more about the JWC, check out the second part of the Sun tutorial, as I mentioned before in the beginning of this, this slide set came from Sun. And uh, this is part two. I've only going to be a part one. Part two is uh, covers topics like cursors, connection pools. Um, I believe I actually have part two downloaded. And I sometimes I optionally go through it, depending upon time. So we'll sort of see tomorrow. I might talk about cursors and connection pools and stuff tomorrow, depending upon uh, uh, has time permits. But uh, the summary of this one: the JDBC uh, connection. We already seen the six steps, making sure to wrap the JDBC calls within the try catch block. Good point to take home. Not quite sure what happened here. I don't know why bullets aren't supported. So and prepare tape is faster, obviously easier to use. Uh, the set with the the data type. And the joins, connect two or more tables, transactions are grouped by two or more database calls together, commit rollbacks work. So and that was the end of the JDBC connection. Uh, it is uh, 3 o'clock. Um, do we want more? I'm sorry? Yeah, we can take a look at the same. Let's do that. Uh, don't save. Did I thought I did this one already? Save. Oh, there we go. I thought I closed that one already. Let's take a look at this assignment I keep talking about. Excellent idea. Uh, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. I was uploading something. Uh. <coughs> All right, so this infamous assignment I keep talking about is uh, in the assignments link. And Oops, I'm sorry. It's in the project link. It's not the assignment. It's a, it's a project, not an assignment. The first project, let me just download this so we can see what it looks like, has support files. The support files that go with it are all with the, uh, starts out project one, project one. There's only four projects total. The uh, project one is the data.sql. This is the one, let me just take a look here. Uh, mm -hmm. You might, uh, this is a music movie database. Actually, I'll start. Uh, ha! The movies database. This might actually need to be changed. Actually, the format. If it does, don't bother doing it for I don't know how many are in here. Maybe put five in there. Put five, maybe. This is this is inserting like hundreds of records into this table. You don't actually have to do this. You can just put five of them in there if you want. And uh, I made a correction to this, actually. And, oops, I didn't want to do that. Hold on one second and get that back. I made a correction to that, and I put it in, uh, I think my Windows is still open, isn't it? Ah, it is very good. The example, JDBC 1, 2, and 3, use the same table. And I ended up having to change the format of the inserts. I took out, actually, the URL, and I changed the date. So for those of you who are watching this video, who have shown up today, um, you're going to have a problem with that assignment if you don't edit it. Uh, I believe, however, that I put this in the... Uh, I believe that I actually put this revised text file in here because we have a README. Let me take a look here real quick at the project files. This README file is the one that I edited. So what you're going to want to do is go to the README file. Here's your stars table, and here's your data that goes into the stars table. This is the format. 
So this file here is going to be in the wrong format. It doesn't match the doesn't match the table. So you're going to need to edit this data. You don't actually have to use that data. Um, I don't believe there is a date. If there is a date, there's no date in here. The URL got switched for a date is what ended up happening, I believe. Yeah, the URL got switched for a date. So you're not, may, you may not necessarily use this data here. You might actually uh, have to, may, if you're going to do that, don't do thousands of records, only do like five. Let's take a look at the assignment description in a few minutes. But before I do that, example one, two, and three, this is JDBC1, JDBC2, JDBC3, and we're going to run through that in a few minutes. Uh, so let's hold that thought for a second. Take a look at the assignment description. The assignment description is right here. So I'm gonna, now you're going to figure out, well, what is this assignment actually about? Whoa, let's take a look at this a little bit bigger on the screen. JDBC, programming assignment number one for the Java EE course. In this project, we will create a database for an outline movie website. Okay. Using a relational database system, you can populate the database and connect to the, J to the using the client Java program that you're going to write. You're going to write the Java client program. The database will contain information about movies. You can set the value uh, for valuable information for customers. Here are the steps. One, create the database called movie database. You don't actually have to do that. Uh, I should probably edit this, but I haven't. You can call it anything you want. But the movies database, I believe, is the one in here. No, that's called stars. Eh. Actually, this is the table. This is this is the database. You can use the HR database instead of the movies database. I'm sorry, I, I meant long day. I basically ref was trying to refer to the fact that you needed to create the database, but you can call it anything you want. You can call this HR if you want. Actually, you know what? Let me do me. Let me do myself a favor. Uh, create the database, movie database or use the <laughs> default HR database in Oracle. Because I can upload this file when I'm done. Actually save myself a couple lecture to you and also save myself some work at the same time. Okay, so <laughs> all right, so uh, you can use the HR database here. Create a relation, or create the relation of the scheme provided. Use the appropriate data SQL file to populate the tables or uh, let's see. You may need to change the format of the data dot SQL insert statements to match the table uh, format uh, table configuration. C readme.txt. That file has the has the table in there. Write a JDBC program uh, that provides a text-based user interface to support the following. Okay, that's pretty good. And in an actual development environment, the functional look and field requirements uh, for the functions would have been specified, but we didn't do that. You don't actually need that. So uh, every purpose is left out the requirements. So here's the scheme. Uh, and the example I gave you is just creating the stars database, actually. Uh, and the stars database has a date in here, but the data doesn't match it, which is interesting. I think the database, hmm, we have movies, stars, stars in movies, genres, genres in movies, customers. Seems kind of tedious, actually. Yeah. It's not, it seems kind of tedious, but it shouldn't really be that bad. I mean, it's 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 a it's a pretty t it's a ten point project, so it's this is the hardest part. I think is creating the SQL tables. Really, you're given the code. Yeah, you can use the example in the README file to and just put the substitute these values in and, and change the database name. You already have the one for stars, actually. Mm, I believe. Um, you can get away with leaving it out if you can't, if you can't figure out the database part. In fact, I'm not grading you on the database part. I'm only grading you on the application and the JDBC connection. So if you don't know how to do the foreign and the primary key, and the, you know, 
require and stuff. You can probably go through the GUI and figure out how yeah, to do it. <laughs> yeah, the GUI will, you know, you just click a button. It says required, yeah. not required. Uh, yeah, that, that's yeah. What I'm yeah, or if you can't figure out how to do it at all, just make the table essentially and leave it unrestricted and it will still work just fine. And the uh, last but not least, you're writing the JDBC program, write a program that provides the following functionality. It can be a console-based or GUI. Uh, you don't have to do it. A GUI, just console-based is fine, just like what we've done so far. Uh, so this program, uh, when this program runs, the user is asked for the username and the password. I'm going to give you an example of that, actually. I'll show you how to do that. The database user login information, uh, not the password in the build scheme. So it's the login information. Um, or you can actually have it prompt for anything you want. If all is well, the employee is granted to access the message uh, to that effect appears on the screen. The database username and password yeah, to, to connect to the database. Uh, I have one example that hard sets and another one that enters it in. I don't really don't care how you do it. <laughs> so. Provide a menu that allows the employee to print the the screen of the movie features of a star. Here's your running, you're running queries. So um, all movies attributed uh, should appear uh, labeled, neatly arranged. Uh, print a screen, uh, print to the screen a nice neat list of the genres of the movies. Insert a new star into the database, associating an existing star with a particular movie. Uh, you're just basically manipulating, uh, delete a star. You're going to have to basically go through and run a bunch of commands and then you're going to exit the program. So the deliverable here, I don't actually need the database. I have the database. I'll have the database created on my system. All I'm going to do is run your Java program. You need to create this on your system because you don't have the database. <laughs> so, but I'm giving you the database format so it's not too bad. Uh, so all of the source code, uh, the Java, the SQL and so on, and including the binary files, don't really need them. Don't really need the .class files. You can skip that part. Uh, this includes the SQL commands uh, they are used for the database. Make files and file build files. If you have those, you don't need that. Give me whatever you have. Put it in a zip file. You can only upload one file at a time per assignment into the LMS. So go ahead and just zip the entire project together. Don't worry about sending me the database. I've had some students who actually created this in Microsoft Access and sent me the Access database. That's nice. But if you're using Oracle, you're not going to have some, anything to send me. Uh, so let's take a look at the examples that go along with this, unless there are any questions about this assignment. Yeah. Yeah, I'll show you that. Um, let me just make sure I've read the instruction correctly. Uh, where, where was it? Uh, here it is here. When the program is run, the user is asked for the username and the user password, the database user login information, not the password to in the above scheme. Uh, scheme. I don't know what it meant by that. The user, it's the database name and password so that they can connect. Yeah, yeah that's kind of weird. Uh, let's not worry about that. It's the database username and password. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, let's save it. So the JDBC1, JDBC2, and JDBC3 are the examples. This is the README file. I'm going to show you the README file in a few minutes. So here's the readme file. And uh, what I've done here, and I've already actually I've already done this already, but uh, there's some new people sitting here that weren't here. Uh, did I do this at the, on this video or the last video? I'm not sure. You can copy this here, make sure your database is running, go into the Oracle system, go into the, uh, go to the database homepage. And uh, I'm going to be using the HR account for which I've unlocked, if you haven't figured that out yet. I go back through some of the previous videos. I'm going into the object browser, and uh, I oops, not the object, object the relics the bar. SQL. I'm sorry, SQL window. <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> I'm gonna hit on SQL commands, and um, I'm gonna go ahead and paste this stuff in the window here. I've already got this table created, so when I press run here. It's going to come back and give me a message that says that the name is already in use. So that's fine. I've already got it in there. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do here is uh, insert these two, for which I've already done. So if I do that, 
actually, I can just do this here. Make sure they work, actually. And uh, I always just keep removing the stuff here. I assume you don't probably need to. You probably could just leave it alone. But, uh, if I run this, it's going to tell me Oracle invalid character. Uh, let's see. Get rid of this guy here. One row inserted. I probably had something pasted in there that shouldn't have been in there, like a line return or something is what I'm thinking. Oh, there we go. No, I didn't insert it. It inserted it just fine when I took away one of the statements. Oh, the second one's got a problem? Oh, really? You're right. Uh, let's fix that, actually. What's wrong with the format? Two dates. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Let me fix this and I'll upload this file as well. <laughs> good thing we're fixing it. Okay, that's good. Let me save this file here and I may well make sure to replace it with the one that's on the website so it does work. Uh, good thing I tested it actually. And thank you for catching that. Copy. Now let's just take this out and run it. Now again, it's, uh, save me some questions. Oh, no, I'm violated. Unique constraints. Oh, let's see. Do I, did you use the same constraint? Yes, I yes. did. Yeah. What's the problem with this one now? Oh, wait a minute. What is this? Oh. It may be that the guy's in there already. Let me change that. Let me change that to eight. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I may have actually already put him in there. But we just put them in here. The unique constraint, the primary key was that ID at the beginning. I just changed the number of the ID, so let's see. All right, so my database is going to be a little bit different, so I have three of them in there instead of two of them. So. And then I'm going to close this because I don't actually need it any. I'll just minimize it. And uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through the three examples. And the three examples, one of them is going to print the database scheme, the metadata. The other one's going to delete a record, and we're going to update via an SQL template uh, and this is the information that you're going to need to build the uh, build the database so uh, let me save this because I'm going to close this guy get him out of the way so let's see actually you know I'm going to close this one too let's get that guy out of the way so here I've taken the liberty to download the examples already so here's database dbc1 jdbc1 excuse me and we'll see what the interaction does. This shows you the functionality that you actually need to implement. I believe this first one is going to ask you for the username and password. And uh, I'm going to close this one here. So we just have this guy open here. So this is JDBC1. And that's the other thing too. You can flip between the files on this line here, which is kind of like the other reason why I like, J I like JGrasp. Uh, but in this particular example, we are loading the driver. Establishing the connection, and we are asking, print the user. Okay, so this one's going to say, um, please enter the username, please enter the user password, the database password, and then it's going to go through and it's going to execute the query uh, to create the, uh, the create statement. It's going to select star from stars, which is the program that we actually, the table that I actually put in there. And it's going to give us the column information. So it's running, this is the interesting part, the metadata dot get column count and metadata is the result set metadata which is the data about the data which is kind of interesting and we haven't seen this one yet actually so I'm going to build this this is a brand new example no we haven't I mean not that new but we haven't seen it and then when I run it please enter the, and this is what the assignment is asking you to do so please enter the username well it's going to be HR please enter the password HR and then now we have the metadata. The metadata, the results of the query, there's five columns. And these are the numbers, uh, one, two, three. And these are the data types. And there's the first guy. Actually, I should have three of them in here. Or do I have more? Eddie Murphy, I've got Arnold, Eddie Murphy. Yeah, I've got three of them in there. Eddie's under, Eddie Murphy's in there with two different IDs. So, because I added them in. So that is example uh, number one, which will... Yep. 
That is this one here. So if you look on the bottom here of the screen, when I highlight, oops, I can't do that all in the same time. Yes, I can. Oh, you see it at the bottom. On the bottom of the screen right here, actually. If I could move my mouse down there, it goes away. <laughs> but you see the, that's database yeah, one, yeah. two, three. OK, good. That's, that's a hard thing to demo, I think. <laughs> so, all right, let me go back to Windows here real quick. Let's see. All right, so that's number one. Uh, number two, what have we got going on here? Two, they're all different. That one's, that one's giving us some metadata, which is interesting. Uh, number two, I believe, is going to, uh, what is number two going to do? Well, it's, it's written in the description, actually. I think it's going to print out stuff. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry? No, all in one. Put it all in one program. Yeah, put it all in one program. Uh, this one's going to delete stars where the ID, oh, it's going to delete Eddie Murphy out of here. And it's going to tell you that uh, it's going to take, an, this one is actually, okay, so this one's going to run a DDL command to delete. And then it's going to come back and show you how to deal with the results set uh, after a delete has been performed. And uh, actually, it might be interesting to play around with this particular example and see what happens if you put a bad ID in there. So it can't delete something. And you can see how the error checking might work. So enter in the database name, HR. And what then, is that about as a class name? Oh, scanner. It uh, came with Java 5, the SDK 5, I think, version. Oh, replaced. Um, it's, it's, it's for user input. Scanner is a is an object you're going to create. The scanner scanner here, Noel. Scanner is going to be used to take the input from the user. Yeah, it's uh, it was introduced, I believe, in version five. Maybe it's one of the newer actually newer IOs. If you're if you have, it's been a while since you used Java, uh, do a Google search on the scanner. Actually, you'll see it automates everything, creates the auto screen auto stream for you, and. Uh, some of the I.O. classes were upgraded, and I want to say the significant release was five. And I think we're up to six right now, or seven. No, six. I think we're on JDK s seven. seven. Are we up to seven already, the SDK? The JDK is 1.7, the, but the, the, numbering, the numbering is so confusing, it's ridiculous. Yeah. The SDK version, I believe, is on six. Yeah. Anyway. So I'm going to put in the name, I'm going to put in the password down here, and uh, lo and behold, I get the return value is going to be equal to 1, and it means that I deleted, I deleted Arnold or Eddie out of there. I don't know which one I deleted. So If I change the ID number here, actually I deleted them. So if I run it again, well, I think the connection is still going to work. No, nope, I got 0. So he was, there was nothing to delete. I had already deleted him, so you can kind of see how it might change. Or if I change the value and it's not there, it's going to get zero coming out of that. That's number two, showing you the return values from not a query but a uh, execute update. And number three, let's see what number three's got for us. So, number three has. Da -da 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 -da. Update stars, set the first name. Oh, it's going to do a parameter. So it's going to be an example, a source code example with, uh, you can see that, got the question marks here where we're going to have one and two. Where we're going to set, this one's not really going to do anything. We're not going to see any output from this one. Instead, this is just going to do some update for us. Yeah, so if I compile and run it, it's the code itself is what you're going to want to look at. Make sure it runs correctly. There we go. Actually, let me make this smaller so we can see the output. If I run it, enter the database username, HR, password HR, nothing, because it didn't update for me. So it's, it's the code itself is going to give you the syntax for doing a prepared statement is what this one's for. So these three examples are designed to give you some things that you can work with in terms of that first assignment. You're, again, you're creating one program. One program for all, and uh, the program that you're creating uh, is going to have all that functionality. Come close. I'm not going to. I'm not going to nitpick all of the functionality. Uh, it's a graduate level course, so the concept is, you know, you use as a learning experience. 
there's some people that will copy and paste stuff off of the internet and turn in other people's work and stuff. Well, you know what? You know, it's you're cheating your own education if you're doing that. Seriously, but um, come close. Try to try to mimic it. Some of the instructions uh, might be poorly written. Interpret them as you see fit. Um, I'm not going to grade you on your lack of interpretation skills or my lack of communication skills, one or the other. <laughs> so, uh, questions about the assignment? No. Then I think we're going to end because I think it's about. We're going to be short to get into a brand new concept. The brand new concept we're going to get into next time is uh, going to be the concept of TCP and UDP and sockets over IP. So tomorrow's focus is on internetworking and IP. I'm not going to get into the protocol per se on the addressing and things of that nature. Rather, I'm going to focus on the programming implementation of it, comparing TCP with UDP. Um, we have on the website actually, uh, and just let me show you that again because I'm here. The examples that I'm going to go through if you want to bring your computer or if you want to pre compile and see if things work, um, what I'm going to be explaining tomorrow is going to be. <laughs> lecture 4. Uh, lecture 4 source code is S code, S code here. Uh, I've downloaded actually, I believe I have downloaded, yes I have it right here. Oops, let me get rid of this. I have it right here on my desktop on my Windows system. It's going to be a uh, ask the register this, ask the register. It's going to be about four or five different client server programs using UDP and TCP and it kind of lends itself into the RMI concept. We're going to make it all the way up to RMI, but we're not going to probably cover RMI in this weekend. I'll save it for the next weekend because we still have uh, two, two more weekends left, but we still have one really intense instructional weekend left over. Um, so we're actually at this point up to lecture four for tomorrow. I will also hit some SQL stuff that I haven't covered yet, my SQL related stuff, but I really uh, you can probably look at this stuff yourself, actually. Um, and uh, then we'll take a look at uh, primarily networking stuff tomorrow. So, questions? Project 2, I'm also going to... Oops, I'm having my hair already. Uh, hold on a second. Let's take a look at Project 2. Here we go. So this is all about Project 1. Project 2, let me save this one here. That might actually be the TCP. It might actually be related. And if it is, I'm going to discuss it uh, tomorrow. Well, let me just take a quick look to refresh my memory. I don't have all these projects memorized. <laughs> uh, hello world, RMI. It's not. It's RMI. The third one? Yeah, we can do these out of order. We don't actually have to do these in order. Uh, hello. Thought I was there. Uh, let's take a look here. Let's go back in for a second. To project number three. Well, while I'm here, I'm going to download project four, too. <laughs> Getting smart. Uh, let's see, number three. Nope, number three. I believe you're talking about maybe one of the assignments. I might have an assignment. This one here? Using any program that you want? Using any protocol that you want. Yeah, you can do TCP UDP on this one. This one would make an excellent TCP UDP. In fact, I believe one of my examples is even going to be very this one. Don't turn in my examples, but uh, remind me. You're going to be here tomorrow, right? Remind me about this assignment, and I'll give you a few hint or, hints on things for what you can do for it. And uh, in the meantime, I think what I'll do tonight is also download all the assignments and kind of make sure I can go through those tomorrow as well. Anything else? Well, thank you all for showing, and this concludes the first day of our weekend. So we still have tomorrow, tomorrow at 10 o'clock a.m. You want to show up? Bright and shiny and caffeined, ready to go.